Hey guys, I just want to share a little bit today from the book of John. I'd actually began this series and went through John chapter 11, and I know it's taken me quite a while to get back here, but I'm so glad to be back at John chapter 12, and I'm going to go through the rest of the book this time, finish it off uh, 12 through uh, chapter 21. So today we're in John chapter 12, and if you haven't seen the other chapters, there's actually a playlist on my YouTube channel. So uh, right beneath this video will be um, chapters 1 through 11, so you can go back and check those out. But for today, we're in chapter 12. So uh, the heading at the beginning of this uh, chapter in my translation of the Bible says, the anointing at Bethany, right? And uh, some of you will recognize uh, this event that took place when Mary, the sister of Lazarus, anointed uh, Jesus' feet. Um, with some very expensive perfume and her hair. And there's also a bunch of other things going on in this chapter. It's always hard to really capture um, so much of what's uh, going on in any of these chapters in a, in a short video, but there's a few points that I want to touch on today. Particularly, I want to talk to you a little bit about misplaced motives and misplaced devotion. And so let's. Uh, I'm going to read a few uh, verses, verses 1 through 7. And then just give you my my take on those things. So, uh, John chapter 12, verse 1 says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was, the, was one of the ones reclining at the table with Jesus. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Then one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, the uh, 300 denarii is about the, the same cost as about a year's wages. So this was a very, very expensive offering. Right. So Judas asks, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And that the Bible says that very clearly. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. And Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. And so um, there's uh, a lot going on in those verses alone and then throughout the chapter. But one thing, or at least one theme that kept coming back to me is the whole idea of misplaced devotion and misplaced motives. And we can all be a victim of both of those things. You know, um, Judas Iscariot has his particular um uh, story in the Bible. And, uh, you know, we know him as the one who betrayed Jesus. And um, he, you know, that's an you know, accurate uh, picture of him. But I found that in the Bible and in life, you can learn from everyone, right? And so we could even learn from um, Judas and what some of his motives were and maybe what um, maybe some of his devotions were, even if they were misplaced. And it's not just Judas. In the rest of the chapter, there's also a discussion, which is an ongoing discussion from the previous chapters, right, of the Pharisees. These were the religious rulers and leaders, and they had a lot of misplaced motives and, and, and also devotions um, that were going on. And then it, it also speaks of a third group of, and they're not mentioned specifically, it just says many believed in Jesus, and some of them were even rulers, so some of the religious rulers and some of maybe the secular rulers actually believed in Jesus. But later on in the scripture, it says that they were afraid to make that known publicly because the on the religious side, they didn't want to be kicked out of the synagogue, right? Like if they came out and says, hey, I believe in Jesus, then the Pharisees who were trying to kill Jesus at this time would have expelled them from the synagogue, right? So they didn't want to lose those benefits. So they kept their faith or their belief um, quiet. Right. And uh, that's another sermon. We could talk about, you know, keeping our faith and our belief quiet, um, which is not the call of Scripture. But um, but again, that's another sermon and for another day. And then there were even rulers, too, who believed. 
right? And they kept quiet because the Bible says that the reason they kept quiet was, A, yes, they didn't want to be kicked out of their um, religious observances at the temple, but they also um, loved the praise of men more than God. And so that's the third group. So we've got Judas, we've got the Pharisees, and then we've got these uh, many people, right, and rulers who also believed but didn't want to risk anything um, for their beliefs. So let me talk a little bit about the misplaced uh, devotion first, because that's a really easy one to get into. It's an easy trap. You know, um, it's easy to exalt many things above our relationship with the Lord, right? You could put anything in there. In this case, Judas, you know, from a wrong heart, says, oh, give the money to the poor. Although he didn't really care about the poor, the Bible says, right? He was just wanting to pilfer from the from the purse and, you know, and put money in his own in his own pocket. But the, the idea here was, hey, don't waste that money on Jesus and anointing Jesus's feet, right? Let's let's use that to help the poor. Now, that sounds really good, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, that's part of what we're called to be as Christians, right? To have a charitable heart and to reach out to the less fortunate and the poor. And and so he was saying, look, let's, you know, let's put that into the ministry and we can do the same thing. We can decide that our devotion to our ministry actually becomes higher than our devotion to Jesus. And that's just a trap that we have to be careful of. And so if we can put ministry in there, trust me, we can put anything else in there. We could put our hobbies in there. We could put bad things too that we want to hold on to, right? And we're more devoted to um, than the Lord. But it's also the good things, you know, um, stuff that we do with our time and our treasure and our talents. We can exalt those things over really what our primary devotion should be um, to the Lord. And then it's also um, our motives, like here it says clearly in this particular scripture in John chapter 12, that Judas was in it for the money. Now there are, you know, theologians that say, well, you know, Judas was a zealot and he thought that Jesus was going to overthrow the Romans. And there are many, maybe other reasons that, that, that was animating um, Judas. It even says in one of the gospels that um, Judas was actually indwelt by Satan. Um, and so there, there, there are many different motives here, right? But but one of them was definitely that he was in it for the money. And so I just always ask myself those questions when I'm in the scripture, like, okay, well, what are my motives, right? What am I, quote unquote, in it for, right? And so the, the true motive of our hearts should be Jesus, to see him glorified and exalted, to see his name known. But it's so easy to get off track. And so we have to come back on track and examine our motives. And then the Pharisees also had a ton of misplaced motives. Now, you know, it's a laundry list we could go down, but at the end of the day, their concern was never much about the kingdom of God. I mean, that on the outside, it seemed like that, like we're all about the kingdom of God. So we have to watch out for this guy, Jesus, because he's trying to usurp the kingdom of God. But really, they were really about their own kingdom. And that's a trap that we can all fall into, really taking our eyes off the kingdom of God. Are we doing this for God or are we doing this for us? Right? Is this about exalting Jesus or am I exalting myself. And the Pharisees definitely had their problems. They were trying to build their own kingdom and make sure their own kingdom was secure. And if anything threatened it, like Jesus, when Jesus came and Jesus gave the truth and people were responding to that truth, this threatened their man-made kingdom. And so they wanted to tear it down as soon as possible. And then the third group of people with the misplaced motives were these people in verse 42 in chapter 12. Go do your homework and read it, right? Um, where it says, many people believed in him, even the rulers, even some rulers believed, but they were afraid because on the religious side, they didn't want to be kicked out of the temple. And on the secular side, well, they just valued the praise of men more than they did the praise of God. And, and so as it was in the case of the Pharisees and in the case of Judas and in the case of these many people, right? They thought they were seeing clearly, but Honestly, they were actually blinded. They weren't seeing clearly at all because they had missed the main point. And the main point is always preeminently Jesus, right? And we have to remind ourselves of that as well. We've got to get back to that um, main point. And Mary is really just a picture of that. What Mary did, the devotion she, sh she showed, 
and pouring out that expensive offering on Jesus and, and really placing her, devo her devotion um, in that moment, right where it needed to be at that great cost is really just a picture for us of what discipleship really looks like. It's giving our all for the Lord. It's not having our own motives and our own kingdoms and our own devotions that take place of Jesus or that come in front of Jesus or block out Jesus. But really, our true devotion, our true motive, our true, the, the, the drivers in our heart should be for the Lord Jesus. And then um, Mary's that picture of discipleship. And then in verses 24 through 26, um, there's a picture that's painted there that, you know, I want you guys to go back and, and read on your own, but I'll just read a little piece for you. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. And the one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant also will be. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And so there's a lot there, but pretty much the definition, if Mary showed us the picture of discipleship, right? Those words I just read in verses, chapter 12, verses uh, 24 through 26, they're really the def a definition, right? of discipleship. And what is discipleship? Well, <laughs> one way of putting it is it's pretty much a death sentence, right? Um, in those words, he says, unless a, a, you know, a, a piece of grain falls to the earth and dies, it's no good. But it's in the dying that it produces fruit. Just as in Jesus is dying, he would save us all, right? He'd give us a chance at repentance and a reconnection with the Father and that eternal life. And so unless it dies, right, the fruit is not there. And it's the same thing in our spiritual life too, we've got a lot that we've got to die to when we become a disciple, right? One of the things that we die to is our agendas. So we've all got an agenda. Whether you don't, if you don't think you have an agenda, trust me, you have an agenda. We all have an agenda. And once we become disciples of Christ, he, he's asking us to die to our own agenda and to take on his agenda because his agenda is actually better for us than our own particular agendas are. Um, we die to an old way of living, right? In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, if anyone is in Christ, once you are in Christ, you're a new creation, right? Old things are passed away. So your old way of doing things, your old way of thinking, your old way of relationships, your old way of um, whatever you do, it's all passed away. Everything becomes new or everything should become new, right? And Sometimes it means just a death to whatever you're chasing. That's what that that people like Judas missed. That in Christ it should have been a death to his other agenda, his other things that he was chasing. Whether he wanted to see the Romans overthrown, or whether he wanted to get rich, or whatever his motives are. Because people who come into the kingdom, we all come with all kinds of motives, and we have to yield ourselves to the Spirit of God, so that He can help us to clean up those motives and to redirect our devotions to the Lord. Thus, why we have to die, right? We get invited to that death sentence to put a death to those things. We have to die daily, which means each day we come back on our knees to the throne of grace and we say, Lord, forgive us. Um, we are dying to ourselves. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lead us, guide us, and that's our that's the daily walk of the disciple. So, guys, if you've got some other stuff that you found in the chapter, please leave me uh, some notes and comments, and I will see you guys in John chapter 13. Have a blessed day, and God be with you.